Greetings. So, we dealt with correlation. We're now moving on to regression. And again, I want to remind you that regression is one of our uh, bestiary of four types of analyses where we have y as a function of x, and we are thinking of y as our dependent variable now, and x as our independent variable, or we are producing a calibration curve and we need an equation or um, similar kind of applications like that. So, um, but in general, we're going to be philosophically thinking about our dependent and independent variables in this kind of analysis. So one can easily imagine that um, one has an X and a Y. One has a series of points and you're faced with a problem. How do I actually fit a line to this? Okay, so, you know, one can imagine lots of procedures for fitting that line. Um, we could take some local averages and find a point here and a point here and then draw the line between them. Um, we could s minimize the deviations from this line somehow. Uh, and in fact, what we end up doing, um, and the approach that's, being, that's been kind of agreed upon as the best for our general linear models, is to minimize the squared deviations from the line. In other words, to come up with a formula for the slope of this line which minimizes those squared deviations and that's why this is called least squares regression. It's going to have some advantages when we do that later on because when we want to test for differences we're going to be able to um, make many of the assumptions about these residuals because the deviations, right? The deviations from this line are also known as residuals. And um, if we look at the deviations of those residuals around the line, as we did look at deviations of residuals around uh, the mean in analysis of variance, we're actually going to be able to apply the same general principles um, in fact, we assume the normal distribution of the residuals around the line. So above and below the line, our distribution uh, of residuals will be normal. And once we can make that kind of assumption, we can make comparisons of different lines. For example, we could compare this line and this line and ask whether they have different um, different elevations. We could compare this line and this line and ask whether they have different slopes, all the while us making the assumptions of um, our general linear models just like we did with ANOVA. So philosophically we can actually treat regression very much like ANOVA. So the bottom line is then how do we estimate our slope. Because remember what the first step is in regression is estimating a slope. And we want a formula that's going to take these point values and then find that slope. Now, once we find the slope, find B, which is our estimate of the parametric slope, beta, um, we can then also find the intercept. And we can solve for the intercept, right? So um, we'll take the approach of first finding the slope. And typically our hypothesis or our, uh, our question with regression is about that slope. Is it significantly different from zero, for example? And what is the exact value of that slope? In various biological contexts, we'll see that that slope takes on some very interesting meanings. OK, so um, how do we go about minimizing those squared deviations. Well, there's a beautiful formula for that. <clears throat> Let's let x, a small x, be the deviation of any one x. Here's x, i, y, i here. So this is one particular observation from the mean x. Okay? And let's let y equal the deviation of y, i from the mean y. Okay, so, so here's x bar and here's y bar, and we're looking at the deviations 
from each of these. So the deviation x would be this way and the deviation y would be that way. Okay? And those are our little x and our little y. I know I'm writing really small there, but I think you can see it here. So we have the deviation of any observation's value of x from the mean x, and the deviation of any observation y, I, um, y value from the mean y. All right, so what is our formula? What is our estimator? B is going to be the summation of the product of x and y, all divided by, what is that? This, the summation of x squared. This is the sums of squares, right, for x. And we have in the numerator something about how these deviations go together or don't go together, right, because it's the product. And in fact, this is part of what's called the covariance. And we'll get to using covariance later on. And this is part of the variance. Of course, what's missing from these parts is the degrees of freedom, right? We don't have our degrees of freedom in here, but these are, this is the sums of squares here, and this is the covariance here, the portion of it in the numerator of the covariance. And so um, this makes sense, why? Well, let's kind of write it out. So let's let's put these back into the formula. So if we have xi minus x bar, and we have yi minus y bar, and we plot that over, um, or we, we put that over xi minus x bar and xi minus x bar, I'm taking apart the x squared here, and just, now look what kind of happens here. So we're gonna we're gonna sum these, of course, and these will be components that are summed all together. But if we kind of think about it, what's really happening here? Um, we can't do this mathematically, but we're we're summing all the components. But we can kind of think in our mind what we're really doing is crossing out that, and we have this is an estimate of slope because we have the change in y over the change in x. Isn't that kind of cool? We obviously can't do that. We can't just do that, but if you think of each of these summation parts as having a, um, a component which is the x deviation, and we have two of those in the bottom and one at the top, we can kind of in our minds cross that out, and it does make sense that we're accumulating delta y's in the top and delta x's in the bottom. Ooh, okay. So, it does make sense as a slope estimator. All right, so um, you know what I like to do. I like to use a KISS data set. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this out as xi minus x bar. I'm gonna write it completely out, yi minus y bar, all over the summation of xi minus x bar yv squared. Let's use a KISS data set to calculate a slope. All right, this time I'm going to start with x and y and do this. We're going to choose two points, and we're going to have one, two, three. I think you know now, because you've seen my last video, why I'm using these beautiful numbers, <laughs> right? Because x bar is two, and y bar is two. So all these calculations become stupidly simple. And so for this point, we have what? One and three and three and one for our X and Y values respectively. So if this is our, you know, if this is our point one here, so we have uh, one minus two times, this is individual I equals one here. So we're summing this from I equals one to two. We have two points. Of course, if we had lots of points, we would sum over all endpoints. Uh, and then we have the covariation, but that is three minus two, right? And then our, we go to our next point down here, i equals two. And so we're going through our next iteration of this summation. And so we'll have down here three minus two for the x part and one minus two for the y part. 
and then we put this all over um, xi, so we have 1 for the first one minus 2 quantity squared, plus for i equals 2 we have 3 minus 2 quantity squared. Um, by the way, notice how this is a little bit different than the correlation coefficient. The difference is what allows slopes to be more flexible than r's. Remember r is bounded by minus 1 and 1. If you look back at the formula, there's a reason it's bounded like that. Here, it's not bounded like that because we're just looking at the variation in x in the denominator. All right, so we have 1 minus 2, which is minus 1 times 1, minus 1, plus 1 times minus 1, that's another minus 1, all divided by minus 1 squared, that's 1, plus 1 squared, okay, that's 1. So we have minus 2 over 2, or a slope of minus 1. <clears throat> all right, interesting. So this is our estimate of the slope. Did we need to do all that work? Not really, because we could have done b equals the change in y over the change in x. What's my change in y? 2. What's my change in x? 2. Oh, uh, oh my change in y is minus 2. <laughs> and it's minus 1. Obviously, we're getting the same slope. So this, this was a trivial calculation of this mm -hmm. line's slope um, in this case. It wouldn't be trivial, though, if we had to sum across different points. We wouldn't know exactly where that line fell. So when we increase i to n points, then it becomes more interesting, and it would be much more difficult to use this formula to calculate it, right? We couldn't. We wouldn't, because it's not going through any two of those points only. It's going to go through... Um, uh, um, it may go through no points. Okay. So, that's pretty neat. Um, therefore, so it does make a lot of sense that this B formula is the calculated formula. Now, um, we can go beyond that, right? Because we can say, okay, this line goes through one point that we can figure out. The line should go through x bar and y bar. Um, because we're minimizing the squared deviations from the mean. And so it's going to go through x bar and y bar. And so we can figure out the intercept as a y bar minus b x bar. And now from the intercept, we can get 2 minus a minus 1 times 2. Or the intercept is going to be 4. And we could see, we could solve for that intercept also using our traditional algebraic approach. Um, now, with a line like this, we have two points. And we're fitting a line to it. How good is that fit? With any two points, the fit is perfect. It's going to go th straight through those two points. As soon as we add a third point, it may not. I mean, unless the third point happens to be on the line, right? If we put a point here, no longer can the line, can a least squares regression line go through all three points if it's a straight line. Now, you might think to yourself, yes, but what, it's a, what if it's a curve? I could fit a curve through three points. Yes, you could. All right, so it depends what kind of thing you're fitting. If you're fitting a linear regression, which is really what we're talking about so far here, then two points gives you a perfect fit. How do we measure that perfection of the fit? We measure it with something called R squared. And in this case, R squared will be one. So R squared is a number that varies between zero and one and an R square of one equals a perfect fit. An R square of less than one is less than perfect. Now, if I have two points and I've measured two individuals and I get this perfect fit, 
should I stop there? Have I measured uh, everything I need to measure? Um, actually, so this is the paradox. I've got an R squared equals 1 with this perfect fit. And have I now a perfect prediction equation? Knowing x, I'll know y perfectly. Like, I could predict um, what uh, this y is perfectly 100% of the time. No, because I have no replication on that slope estimate in a sense, right? I have no variation in that slope estimate. I have no standard error possibly can be calculated because I can only get one slope out of two points. And so this is a case where paradoxically I have an R squared of one and I have beta, I have no idea. I mean, I have an estimate of beta, but I have no error on it. So I cannot test. I don't know that beta is different from zero. I cannot tell. And that's why we need many replicate points. Um, by the way, I don't really know that I have a perfect fit either here. <laughs> it's kind of a, it's a pseudo perfect fit, really, right? It's deceptively perfect. I have overfit. So this is another common uh, statistical description for what I've done here. I've overfit my data. Um, basically, I can't do anything but fit it perfectly with two points and a linear regression. And, and so that's a problem in biology is that you want to have a large enough data set. Remember what we're really doing here is we are really estimating some parametric relationship that's behind our sample. Here's our sample. It's trying to indicate something about that parametric population that's sitting behind there. And if we have an infinite sample size, we can know exactly what this line is. But without an infinite sample size, with n less than infinity, b, the slope, is an estimate of beta, and it's an estimate with error. And so just as when we're calculating means, when we're taking a sample, we get error around that. Same, by the same token, we get error around the slope estimate and we don't know exactly what that slope is. The slope could be this or it could be this. You know, I'm getting messy here. The slope could be this or it could be this or it could be this or it could be this. We've got a range, but we don't know exactly what it is. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to put error estimates on B by having lots of replication so we can hopefully get a better and better estimate of the true parametric slope, the true parametric relationship between y and x. And by the way, just a reminder, we regress, just as a terminology thing, we regress y on x when we do this process. Okay, so now you know about how we calculate this regression coefficient, and we'll do exercises in class where we practice this with SAS jump. And by the way, just to give you a hint, we're going to use the platform fit y by x when we again have just one x. Because jump is going to use a general linear model and it doesn't care whether our x variable is nominal or continuous. In this case, it's continuous. It's going to use the same general linear model fitting engine to estimate our slope instead of estimating means, parametric means. All right, very good.